thank you, Brian, for giving us that nice tour of the history of the universe and your incredible part in helping us understand what's going on out there. So we have had questions coming through whilst you've been talking. So to kick things off with the Q&A session, uh, the first question I'm going to ask you is from Miki. And her question is, uh, what did you first think a dark energy or, or this accelerated expansion could be? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll be honest, the first thing I thought it was when we measured it back in 1998 uh, is that it was a mistake. So the universe was not supposed to be speeding up. It was supposed to be slowing down. Speeding up is like throwing a ball in the air and having it go into orbit and take off into space. That's not what a ball does when you throw it up in the air. It goes up and gravity pulls it down. But the universe seems to be like a ball you throw up and it just takes off and goes faster and faster. So uh, when you see crazy things, you, you, you first think you must have made a mistake. But Albert Einstein, back in 1917, so 103 years ago, created this stuff we call dark energy, or the cosmological constant. Uh, it was his name for it. And it turns out, if the universe is full of this energy I told you about, uh, it could make uh, the ball do exactly that, the universe do exactly that, take off. So that was really the best idea we had back in 1998 when we made this discovery. And all these years later, 22 years later, it's still the best idea we have. So the universe seems to be full of energy. Right, yeah, that's a really interesting discovery. Uh, the next question we have is from Ruben. Do you think it's still possible that the universe could end up collapsing upon itself in the end or get uh, dominated by black holes and then form and uh, end in a more compact state rather than what we're seeing at the moment. All right, so could the universe change directions in the future? So the answer is yes, although it's probably not very likely, okay? Because what would happen is if the universe keeps going on its current path, it, it will just get bigger and bigger. If we are going to have the universe turn around and collapse, we need to have something undiscovered even more important than this energy that right now makes up 70% of the universe. Now, my friends who are theorists, people who are like Albert Einstein and write down equations, can create such stuff but there is no evidence that exists right now. So I can't say it's not going to happen, but I have no reason to believe that it will happen. It turns out that in science, uh, nothing unfortunately is ever absolutely for sure. Uh, and I know we always talk about science being absolutely right. Well, it's, it's, it's right most of the time, but we always have to keep checking it. And science allows airplanes to fly and all sorts of, you know, the internet to work. So it's a very, very powerful, but we always have to check all the little details to make sure they're right. Right. Um, can you tell us what, or sorry, this is a question from uh, Ruben, or sorry, Oaks rather. Uh, is dark energy the same as dark matter? Ah, so I haven't talked about dark matter at all today. But the universe appears to be made of many things. Now, some things you know about. First thing, atoms. Astronomers call those things baryons. I'll just call them atoms, OK? Uh, it's also made out of light. Now, you don't think of light as something, but we think of it as something. It, it turns out it has energy, and so it turns out it has gravity. Now, light right now is not very important in the universe, but back at the time of the Big Bang, it was the most important thing in the universe. We then have uh, things called neutrinos. Now, neutrinos are a particular type of particle related to atoms, but a little different, but they're funny. They can go right through the earth. Uh, and we've known about them for a long time, uh, longer than I've been alive but they're really hard to measure because 
uh, you got to have, you know, because they can go right through the earth, you got to have a lot of stuff to see any of them, even if you have hundreds upon hundreds of billions of them. The energy I told you about, dark energy, is energy that seems to be everywhere and causes gravity to push rather than pull. And finally, the thing I haven't talked about is everywhere we look, there's more pulling gravity than we think there should be by the amount of, of, of atoms. Like for example, we look at a galaxy, we can measure how much pulling gravity there is uh, by how it's, it's, it's spinning. It turns out that allows us to weigh the galaxy. And we always come up about a factor of six or seven short. Uh, and we have been able to do lots of experiments in astronomy, but nothing on earth yet. And we always come up with the idea that for every atom, there's six and a half times more of something that has gravity, but it's invisible. And it's invisible and can travel right through the earth like a neutrino, but probably even better at traveling through the earth than a neutrino. It turns out a neutrino needs about a light year of lead to be slowed down. A light year of lead. Oh, you know, so that's a lot. This stuff probably needs even more uh, to be slowed down. And that's why we haven't been able to detect it yet. But we're not sure it's, uh, it's complicated. But dark matter and dark energy, we think, are completely different things. But some people are trying to make them the same thing. And it would be great if they were the same thing. But at this point, I'm afraid I don't see any reason why they should be the same thing. Right. So a lot of work still needed to understand these. Uh, astronomy has a lot to do, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, that's good for us. Yeah. Um, the, the next question I have comes from Misa as, how are you able to estimate how long until a star burns out? Ooh, okay. So when we look at a star, a star is a giant nuclear reactor. And in the same way here on Earth, we can create nuclear reactors that provide power and generally speaking, don't blow up. Uh, we can use those same equations uh, to go through and run the nuclear reactor of the star. And it turns out the star takes hydrogen, which we see a bit on Earth. You don't come across it very often. It's part of water, but it's bound up with oxygen there. But it takes pure hydrogen and essentially in the heat and the intense pressure and density, that is everything is really, really heavy in the middle of the sun, those four hydrogens come together to form a helium and create a nuclear reaction. That's the same nuclear reaction that's in a hydrogen bomb, a nuclear bomb, that not one of my favorite things to have here on Earth, I'm afraid. Uh, so over time, the sun takes hydrogen, makes it into helium. But our sun cannot, it turns out, easily make helium into other things at the same time. So slowly but surely, the center of the sun goes from being hydrogen to being helium. And when it becomes too much helium, the hydrogen can no longer do that nuclear reaction and make the sun shine. And so the details are the sun has to rearrange itself a little bit. And when it does that, it puffs up. That's when it eats the, eats the earth. Uh, and that allows it to burn a little bit more of what it's made out of, but eventually it can't do that. And when it completely runs out of fuel, it collapses down into that white dwarf star and throws off its outer bits. So we, we can get an estimate on their lifetime based off the, the physical process that powers them. Yeah, so we That's... run the nuclear reactor equations and they say, we think the sun uh, has burned for four and a half billion years. It turns out we can measure that by radioactive dating of what the, of what the Earth's made out of and other things and, and, and meteorites. Uh, and then we're gonna run those equations. How long is our nuclear reactor gonna run? And the answer is, it's a little imprecise. It's between five and I would say eight billion years longer. But so we're, we're, we're at worst halfway through the life of the sun. All right. That's Still a long way to go, though. A long way. Five billion years is a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, the next question comes from Addy. Uh, and he asks, 
what do you want to learn about next uh, for space? Uh, and he goes on to say, I'm six and going to astronomy today to look at telescope buildings. What's your favorite thing there? And what's your favorite thing about space? Ah, okay. Uh, thank you. So what do I really want to learn about space? Well, lots of things. But one of my favorite things I want to see is I want to understand how the first stars in the universe were born. So right now the universe is full of stars, but if we look back further and further and further in time, closer to the Big Bang, we'll be able to see the first stars in the universe being born, seeing how literally everything we know came to be. That strikes me as one of the big exciting questions that I think we're gonna be able to figure out pretty well over the next 10 years or so. So that's something when you finish high school, you could go in and start studying, I think, and really get the right answers uh, 10 or 15 years from now. Uh, up at Mount Stromlo, uh, a little secret thing. You can walk up to what is known as Duffield's grave. So the, the, the observatory is one of the oldest places in Canberra. And at the very top of the hill, you have to walk by the new telescopes that are up there. Uh, there is a place where Walter Duffield is there. And you can look back and see all of the other telescopes. I think your parents are going to be mad at me because it's about a 20 minute walk. So it's a long ways, but it is probably my favorite place up at the mountain because it has the whole history of that great place uh, there. And it's got a pretty good view of Canberra as well. Yeah, I walked there a few times during my PhD. As you said, it's a lovely view. Um, the, the next question is coming from Tom, who's asking uh, the, the famous question of, what are your thoughts on alien life? Do you think that they exist? Ah, so I'm pretty confident that aliens in some form exist, probably, like bacteria or something like bacteria, because when we look at Earth, uh, life formed on Earth almost as soon as it could. Uh, although it's hard to know for sure because it looks like all life on Earth has a single common ancestor. So it's not like life formed again and again and again. It seems to have only formed once. So uh, the fact that it forms so quickly on Earth is reasons to believe it should be quite common to happen on planets like Earth. Uh, and the fact that it only formed once on Earth is a reason to believe, well, maybe it's more rare than we think. I think humans, uh, animals that are smart like us, well, we're rare on Earth. And some would say, uh, it's not even clear, we're smart based on how we behave sometimes. But uh, I think uh, aliens, as in people who can travel through space, they're going to be pretty rare, but the universe is so big. My guess is it's so big with so many chances, there will be things like us, uh, similar to us, probably not identical to us, but like us somewhere in the visible universe. But the good news is we can go out and look with the new telescope. So, uh, the Australian National University with a bunch of partners uh, across the world is building a giant telescope that is going to literally be able to look at planets, watch the light travel through their atmospheres and see for the first time whether or not there's actually evidence of life within those planets' atmospheres. Because life has, for example, created the oxygen inside planet Earth. But if we have an advanced civilization, they will have polluted their Earth's, their atmosphere just like we have ours, and we'd have a chance to see stuff like that as well. So that's still a fair ways away, but over the next 10 to 20 years, I think there's some really good opportunities to even look for aliens, but probably not the time, the type that fly in UFOs. Yeah, it, it is really exciting to see how astronomy is now approaching the possibility of answering this question. Um, the yeah. last question, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I think it's worthwhile reflecting is I still, I'm 53 years old now, 
and that'll seem very, very old, but I still remember being six and asking questions, many of the same questions that you have asked, but some questions that I asked, we've answered. Are black holes real? When I was six, I didn't think black holes are real, and a lot of people didn't think they were real. They're very clearly real now. Uh, do planets exist around other stars? Didn't know that when I was a kid. We know now. So we're really learning things. Yeah. Uh, so the final question from me, and then I'll hand over to Tim, is from Amanda. This is uh, more related to what you've been talking about. Uh, what is the universe expanding into? Ah, oh, the expanding universe. This is really complicated. Uh, so the universe, we think, as near as we can tell, goes on forever. That's a hard concept. Infinity. It goes on without end. So I want you to think about what happens when you make infinity bigger. I can do that with mathematics. And for those of you who are old enough to do, do the mathematics, where you, you do one of these things with a little number line, uh, like, like one of these things, I'm putting it up because I remember learning this when I was a kid. If I can, oh, it's not working, there we go. Uh, I want you to think what happens when you expand the universe. One goes to two. So if I double the size of the universe, one goes to two, two goes to four, four goes to eight, eight goes to 16, and every number goes someplace else. Now, the part I haven't told you about, and that's for a different lecture, maybe if you come and study physics at ANU, is that time is really important in all of this because it takes time for, to get from point A to B. And it turns out that the expansion of the universe is into the future. So my easiest answer for you to say, a little flippant, is that the universe is expanding into the future. And yes, it's getting bigger, and infinity is getting bigger. It turns out that's allowed in mathematics. Uh, it's not easy to accept, but that uh, time helps it uh, all make sense within the equations of physics? That's a tough question to finish on. All right, I think we're gonna hand over. Yep, so Tim will give you the last question. Great. Well, thanks so much for the, uh, the fascinating talk, Brian, and for answering all of these great questions. Um, I have this uh, final question for you. Uh, earlier this year, we challenged the young stars to imagine what the future might be like 100 years from now. Uh, they decided they want to colonize the solar system uh, to avoid global conflicts, design fusion reactors, uh, promote gender fairness, and even create a robot that does homework. Uh, so given as that we're going to be now uh, recovering from this global pandemic, uh, it seems we have a new opportunity uh, to chart a course towards the future that we want to see. What is your advice to, to the young stars joining us today about how they can engage with science and make their vision for the future a reality? All right. Well, you know, science makes you really, really powerful because you get, when you learn science, you get to learn what every human in history, all that combined thinking, you get to learn it all. And that's how we get to make and do cool things. So if you wanna do all those things that we just talked about, you're gonna use science to do all of them. And it's not just science, it's also, you need to do your history and your languages, English if you're an English speaker, because you need to be able to communicate people with people and read and understand to, to suck in all that knowledge. So learning science, even if you don't become a scientist, it'll allow you using that type of knowledge to understand things and to do things in the future. And as a Nobel Prize winner, uh, you know, people think I did a lot more than I probably really did because my piece of work was a little bit on thousands of people's work. But I was the person 
who was at the right place at the right time to make the big discovery. But without the thousands of other people making also interesting discoveries along the way, I would have never been able to make mine. It's the collective effort. And so we need to remind ourselves, and since we have people from 30 countries here, science is a great place where we continue to work together, even if the people who run our countries don't always get along, scientists always do their best to keep solving the problems and figuring out, for example, how to make COVID-19 go away, but also how to create uh, energy that's really, really cheap that everyone can use around the world so we don't pollute the earth any more than we need to and we can all live on earth together. That's also what science does. So it's really important, no matter what you do in life, to know some, and no matter what you do in life, you can use science to help you do your job a lot better. So please keep learning and keep sharing. And uh, it's great to have so many people around the world here today. It makes me feel uh, very, uh, very happy um, because, you know, uh, when we're all in our homes together, the world feels like a very big place. But the fact that we can all talk to each other now using this technology, a lot of it actually directly out of the physics and astronomy I'm talking, I've been talking about today, uh, it makes the, the world actually that much closer. And so hopefully we learn from that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that insight there, Brian. Uh, I think that uh, all the young stars joining us today have uh, not only learned something about the universe, but really valued your perspectives as a, as a leader in science. So thank you so much for making time to, to be here with us. Uh, we truly appreciate it. My thank you and good luck, everyone.